since 1975. Atlanta Dragway has been Georgia's house of speed. Entering Friday night qualifying, top fuel driver Clay Milliken made the facility's fast pass ever, 331.12 miles per hour. But now the stage is set for a day of drag racing that provides everyone the same opportunity to become a winner. The National Hot Rod Association stands for speed, power, sensory overload, explosive action, and has a rich history of equality. Shirley Muldowney wins it. Unmatched in sports today. And Shirley Muldowney is the world champion. For more than 65 years, crew chiefs have pulled more and more horsepower from these fire-breathing machines. The secret to the sport's success has been diversity. In 1958, Shirley Muldowney made her debut on the drag strip, setting a precedent the sport still embraces today. Greatest lady driver ever, Erica Anders. The door's wide open right now for any aspiring driver, male or female. Brittany Force is the 29th champion in the history of NHRA Mellow Yellow Top Fuel Racing. With the sisters who are the number one qualifier and who always have each other's back. This is what dreams are made of, man. Oh, I am stuck. Woo! Now, we come to Atlanta to watch these women of power. Driven to succeed their unconditional devotion to the most extreme of sports. The NHRA on FS1 starts now. And with the roar of 10,000 horsepower, top fuel cars starting here in at Atlanta Dragway, we welcome you, man, woman, and child, to the 38th annual NHRA Southern Nationals, powered by Mellow Yellow. And Tron Brown, Dick Alexander, start today's action. Runners that represent qualifiers in the number eight and nine position, they can be found on top half of our top fuel ladder presented by Lucas Soil. How about Clay Milliken, the 13th number one? That ties her with the, one of the NHRA's most successful one ever. Shirley Mulowney in that category. Leah Pritchett is also on the top side of the ladder. And another great qualifying effort from Brittany Force. She'll take on Terry McMillan and Tron Brown against Blake Alexander on the starting line right now, but as well coming up, Doug Coletta taking on his teammate, Richie Crampton. So the day begins, Dan Tron Brown, who lost first round at the four wides. Lost again in the first round. Before that, so back-to-back -back first round losses for Anton Brown, part of a Don Schumacher team in top fuel that is struggling. It's been highlighted, it's been documented, and I'm documenting again between Anton Brown, Tony Schumacher, Leah Pritchett. These are three successful drivers and haven't won the last 13 events on tour. The Don does not like that. Careful though with Blake Alexander. Smoke Antron Brown is out again as Blake Alexander does take the win. 3.827. Another frustrating moment for Don Schumacher, who is joined out by John Kernan at the starting line. Well, Dave, as you mentioned, it's been since Brainerd last year that a top fuel team from Don Schumacher Racing has won. And Don, after seeing that, is frustration starting to weigh on your mind? I mean, it's been a frustrating season so far, not winning any of the races. Uh, the Army car's done great. The Metco car's done great. Leah's done great. I mean, all of my teams are in the battle, and that's all I can look for. I got great people. I have total confidence in them. So all is good. I mean, that explosion shouldn't have happened. Hard to say what happened. Well, earlier this morning when I was talking to Don, he told me that he had no plans of making any personnel changes right now. And why would he? Because in the ultimate game, he's got three top fuel drivers that could be found 
and top six in point standings, along with two-time Funny Car champion Tony Pedregon, the comp to later champion Bruno Messala, I'm Dave Reef, welcome to the booth. Right away, here we go. Antron's already out, but Tony Schumacher's coming up next. How do you like the Sarge's chance today? Well, I think the Sarge always has a very good chance, not just because of his credentials and his resume and his experience, but, you know, like uh, Don Schumacher said, uh, th they win the internationals had it not been for a rear end breaking. And this is still a relatively new team, but they do have chemistry, and that's one of the most underrated things that these teams can possess out here. So I think it's a beautiful day for racing, and I think uh, Tony Schumacher with this Army car, uh, I, I don't think that's going to rattle him one bit. The only track at which he has never won Tony Schumacher, though, has gobbled up the most bonus points, so they've been good in qualifying, but just not on race day. Now let's talk about the other driver, Leah Pritchett. She was on fire last year. What's going on with that team? You know, this team has done a lot of development, not only for Leah Pritchett's team in the fire team or whoever she's driving for this weekend, but all of Don Schumacher Racing. So they've developed parts and pieces that help this entire organization as they move towards the countdown, and that's what they're all here for. We talked about Leah's success early last year, the struggle at the tail end. It's all about ramping up for the countdown. We're wrapping up the next set of cars firing. You mentioned it's Tony Schmacher, the Don Sun, 21st attempt to win here. Keep in mind, this is a racetrack that produced 23 different winners, one of those being a former NFL quarterback in Dan Pastorini. Come on, Sarge. Today your day? Well, it is. He's got to get around Bill Litton, just his fifth race ever in his top fuel career. Financial advisor out of Texas area. Certainly knows how to raise money. Now can he raise the stakes now on Tony Schumacher? Bill Litt, the guy that's wanted to race in the top fuel category since he was eight years old, did have a career best in qualifying. But the wild card continues to be the tune-up inside of Don Schumacher top fuel actors. We mentioned for Tony Schumacher for breakage, we might already be talking about him. Key to success for any of the teams today is not to be too aggressive with the clutch. That could result in car losing traction. You have to manage the power. In the case of Intron Brown, his teammate, who lost directly in front of him, the car launched good. He was well in the race, but the car, one of the cylinders lost fire. So that's one of the other challenges. The more fuel they could burn, the more power the motors to balance it, you have to be able to burn that fuel in the chamber. Tony Schumacher hits the pre-stage pole. He's doing so qualifying for his 350th consecutive race. Nobody's ever qualified consecutively that long in top fuel history. And a cylinder up. Does it cost him? Yes, it does. Tony Schumacher's bounced. No words needed to express Don Schumacher's feelings. Go back and take one more peek there. Well, right here, that's the raw fuel coming out. That's what cost Tony Schumacher the race. And alongside of him, Bill Litton was doing his business just like he did. Very strong and qualifying, advanced to the next round. Well, the NHRA live 24 hours a day on all of our digital platforms. And when you head to Twitter, you can follow the NHRA and check out more about Drew's Pedragon exercising a long winless streak looking to be a very good competitor again here this weekend. We're talking about the win of power, driven fearless champions. And the big question is, does Clay Milliken turn his third green hat of the year into his second yellow hat ever? And watch out, you do not want to miss Amanda Busick and Angel Sampe later today. Walking a 1,000 feet, the NHRA on Foss. NASCAR race up. Fun, fast, fresh, and always entertaining. It's going to be a good one. NASCAR Race Up, weeknight, 6 p.m. Eastern on FS1. I would say the greatest thing is probably being an inspiration to young girls. Having a lot of young girls come up to our ropes and tell us that they want to grow up and be a race driver. That's probably the coolest thing about being a female in this sport saying that gender plays no role in what we do. I mean, the race car knows no different. When I put my helmet on, it, it doesn't matter. I still strive to be the very best driver that I can. The cover of our publication, National Director, says it all. They are driven, they are fearless, and they are champions. And there are nine of them competing today in our four professional categories in Atlanta. And among the totals that have, they have amassed, 96 total wins, six championships. So we get a unique look 
from a new camera, our sub aerial cam. We're back at the starting line. The reigning top fuel champion, Brittany Force, and her monster energy sit in the right hand lane. Brittany Force trying to avoid the upsets we've seen by successful racers Tony Schumacher and Anton Brown to start today. She has a tough competitor in the opposite lane. It's the Amelie team of Terry McMillan. But, you know, honestly, the Amelie team is no longer an upset team as far as I'm concerned. They've been in two finals already this year. Rob Wendland's got this car running really well. The only thing holding them back from the 360s is they're having a hard time getting the car to run quickly through the first 60 foot. That is where their approach has been. But for them, it's all about consistency, making consistent quick runs and themselves positioned to win. Walk in the park for Brittany. 377, 321 miles an hour, and that pushes her round record versus Terry McMillan to an upside down Gotti. 17 round wins versus only two defeats. Great pass by the Monster Energy team as we send it up to top end where Amanda Busick found a pair of interviews. Blake Alexander seems to keep taking out the Giants in round one. Tony Schumacher was his first round win ever and now begins Antron Brown. Do you get flustered at all at the starting line? Uh, no, I mean, these are the type of guys that you stay up late thinking about racing. When you're a kid, you just, you know, have always wanted to do that. So I try to block everything out and, you know, go up there with a clear line, like he says, and maybe I took a page out of his book. And I mean, I, we got a little lucky, but, uh, you know, he hurt, he, he hurt some parts. That's not how we want to do it out here, but we're happy. Well, Andron, as I move over to you, it's been a frustrating start to the season for Don Schumacher Racing. We just heard from your team owner. It's been since Seattle last season since you've had a win. Are you getting any pressure from your team owner? No, I mean, Don's got, got back 100%. Uh, we're adjusting. I mean, we're building with our team. We, we had some different deals moved around, but, it, I mean, we've been on great runs, really good runs, and this is getting frustrating because we're working so hard, and we know the results are right around the corner. I thought today was our day, and to get out there to drop a hole and for that to happen, I mean, I just I feel bad for our team, but you know what? This team will not quit. We will not give up. We want to stay focused and keep after it. Great respect for Mantron Brown. Well, it is a top fuel category in the history of the sport that has featured 21 female competitors. Audrey Worm hit the 21st. This category that has also produced nine winners. Audrey Worm's first round opponent will be Clay Milliken at the track speed mark, 331 in qualifying. And this is a team that has had low ET three of the first six events so far. Never claimed up. They actually came into its race short on parts. This is three races in a row, the last of the string, and it's an independent team that has to really stress the bud stress the budget to get here. So they didn't want to hurt part. The same engine they started the weekend with is in the car right now, which I think is hard to believe in modern day fuel. But their whole emphasis is trying to just tune up that we all know to knock it out of the park, to scale it back a little bit and get down the trip and race it. That has been the challenge. But during qualifying they made a number of consistent runs. The only one they didn't get down was one they tested the track last night. This is Audrey Warren, 26-year-old from Pennsylvania that works Pennsylvania State Police. Perhaps she can work her own crime scene. Truck break-in on the way here. Thieves got away with superchargers, pistons, and racks, as well as the team scooter. Good luck selling those fellas. Everybody's not looking for that, but it's Audrey Worm in just fourth ever race. They got a round win at the full lines just days ago. Did she knocked number one here. We're about to find out. Clay stumbles, and that's not going to happen. 383, 323 miles an hour. You saw Audrey Worm's tire tracks leaving the starting line. That's a team flirted with that center line. That is something you don't want to cross. That would have involved a points deduction as well. Quick reminder, in two weeks after off weekend, we're heading to Topeka, Kansas for the Menards NHRA Heartland Nationals presented by Minty's with qualifying Friday. NHRA today again on Sunday. The finals coming your way 2 o'clock. Eastern, and that will feature live final right here on FS1. But on this beautiful Georgia day, next up it's Terry Haddock, the Temple, Texas run. And he has a tough customer, the Capco team, that has won half of the top fuel races so far this year. Of course, the pilot there is Steve Torn, last year's series run up, bit of ending champion here. The guy who got his first of 19 ever wins right here in Atlanta back in 2012.
A unique look here at the staging lights, Tony. What are we going to be looking for here? Well, the light, blue light, that's a pre-stage, and the car has to pre-stage before they stage. Now, each lane is individually timed. This is strictly a sprint to finish line, but to allow for a fair start, once both cars are staged, the drivers are reacting off the yellow light, not off the green. If you wait till the green, you're going to see your opponent already about a car ahead of you. The red light distinguishes a foul. You don't want to do that. You want to allow for a fair start. Give yourself a chance and try to get to that finish line. See that white light down the center. Watch those colors to change quickly to John Kernan. Steve, Tor Steve Torrance and Scott Palmer uh, both played teammate game on Saturday, putting a little bit different setup in each one and then using the best of that later on. Talking to Richard Hogan. Tony, you talk about how tricky this track be with a couple of bumps. He says it's very hard when you have a fast car to slow it down just right to go down the track. Well, Hogue did a good job there. 3.802 at 326 miles an hour. Steve Torrance advances, where he will await the winner of Doug Coletta and Richie Crampton. Torrance, a guy that's got a lot of swagger, and he's got back here after winning three of the first six races of the year. One year ago, Leah Pritchett won three of the first five. The Fire 18 coming to the starting line on this Women of Power weekend with the HRA from the 38th Annual Southern Annals, powered by Mo Yellow. Fire starter. Here's my problem with this happening. We have deep rooted issues. The only way to start an NHRA Sunday race is the Seal Master Track Walk. Chance to come out and see what the starting line's all about. Bruno Messel, you took part of that with a very special legend this morning. Yeah, it was a great opportunity to catch up with the legendary Daddy Don Garland. You know, as a guy who's pretty much done it all, been there, seen it all, got a little bit of intel as hidden sight from racing not only a hole, but here at Atlanta. Dragway, he had some great stories to tell. Don Garland's last competitive round came right here. Ran it first. Proud of the Schumacher Dot Fuel organization on the starting line now. Here's Leah Pritchett trying to save the day from a team that lost round one at the last event. He's the last, not only woman, but last Schumacher driver standing. Her opponent will be Pat Dayton out of Dayton, Ohio. Oh, and you're as popular as Leah Pritchett and as good a driver as you are, you get the opportunity to go share your story. And she was able to do that at the Shell Wood Creek Complex, at a Shell Woman Complex, or a... a Opportunity with to meet with some of the shell execs though. Got to tell her story. What a great way to spread not only the women power message in the NHRA But the NHRA story as well That's really amazing for for the women in the workplace it, To to hear but they can relate to it. You know, they they wake up early in the morning They're dedicated to their jobs and, and they put and invest a lot of time as does a race car driver like Leah John Kernan. And you know Dave she's been busy. We've been on the road for three straight races and so she's had some special plans for when she gets home back to the Brownsburg, Indiana area. She told me that uh, as soon as they can, they're going to put a boat in the water on the lake, and they are coming off of it until next Sunday night. That's it. I'm changing my flight. I'm going to Indy so I can crash that party. Right now, Pat Dake is going to try to crash hers. Not going to happen. Wasn't pretty, but it was pretty enough. Last year at this time, she led the points, had three wins. Well, she just earned her sixth round win of 2018. It was 20 points. A little hard come by this year. Let's take a look at an onboard. Let's take a ride with Leah. Let's listen to the the sound of the engine. It gets near the finish line. Listen to it rev up. That's a good indication that the tires were spinning. You can see the tires loose, so that's the explanation for that raw fuel coming out. The engine starts to rev up. It's pouring a lot more fuel in the motor, and it only ran 293 miles an hour. So what the tuner's going to be able to do is take that data. He'll download it off the onboard data recorder and address it. So in other words, if the car lost traction at 3.2 seconds, he's going to make an adjustment in the clutch to slow it down at about 3.1 seconds. So next pair. Teammates, if you will, out of the Conrad Coletta organization as Leah Pritchett round the corner at the top end. We're talking about the Mac Cools machine of Doug Coletta, former USAC Sprint Car champion. Up against the man who came from down under once, drove a hold in there. 
on his way to the States and is on his way into the seat of the DHL Valletta Air Funny Car. We're talking about Rick Kraft. There is the bounty hunter, the man that makes it all work. Johnny Kalita, a winner in top fuel in 1994 over another racing legend at Hill. You look at the front of Richard Kraft's car, the very nose of it. You know, this thing obviously paints to Mr. Hill a DHL airplane. Look at the front, there's a little cockpit. I don't think you can catch a shot of it right now, but on that cockpit, they've been putting characters. This is the kind of fun they have over at Motorsports. It's the tuners, we're talking about the man you just saw, Conrad Coletta and Rob Flynn. They're the ones piloting this this, uh, this airplane, so to speak. Well, what's interesting, Tony, is about this matchup is the fact these guys have met so much this year. Only in Phoenix, the only time that Richie Cran and Doug Coletta have been on the starting line in some capacity against each other, keeping in mind the four wide. Well, and these two drivers have been trading off. There was a couple of races ago that Richie Crampton put it on double and most recently, it was the opposite. It's gonna be a walk for Doug as he goes 3.845 seconds. Doug already with three wins here in Atlanta, looking to get his first. It's an epic final back 2016. Broke down the run, your run, the booth, and could clearly see the tire spinning. How do you react to that inside your car? You actually you make a decision of you don't see that other guy and pedaling it isn't going to make it go any quicker at that point. So hats off. That round went right there is for the Ronnie Thame Foundation. Lucy's been with us this entire weekend uh, with Make a Wish and Spark Nice. But you, you know what? It's race day. It's Sunday. You don't hear me you really see him, and uh, you stick with it. And the number one goal on that run for me was to hit that bump square and straight. And it was hazy, but you know what? We got that win like the fire aid team. So. Thank you. The only chance for John Schumacher Racing to win a volley here today. And that's our advanced auto arts advancing to the next round interview with Leah and Lucy. It's Mike Salinas. First time racing in 2018 with Lane Choice. That's Mike on the right side of your screen. He will be taking on Scott Palmer. Back boat aficionado who also has a student maker that runs on Nitro. Scott Palmer's got some very cool toys. Why don't you do me a favor? Grab the remote real quick. Hit volume button. Push it as high as you can take because it is time to crank up for the NHRA. That's right. races we've had this year this uh this first round how about mike salinas 378 with a margin of victory just nine thousandths of a second left first by a little bit ran better by a little bit that one was unbelievably close mike salinas he started his work right on the starting line very solid getting the slight jump out of gate that's what you have to do against the scott palmer because that car is proven it's so consistent and every qualifying run that mike salinas left side of your screen made progressively got quicker so he stayed on his game he's got confidence you can see it right at the finish line lucas oil finish line cam by a nose let's take a look at the last now for top fuel heading round number two with the number one qualifier advancing but it's mike salinas with that margin of victory that will pick his lane against the top qualifier. Leah Pritchett will select hers when she takes on Bill Litton in round number two. Likewise, Brittany Force will have lane choice again. A little bit of a surprise. Blake Alexander and Steve Torrance will pick his lane against Doug Letta. Funny cars will come your way next. And when it comes to Cruz Pedregon, very lively conversations with him. If you have troubles getting your car down the racetrack, Cruz says adjust your clutch. He did that more. We'll explain when we come back. Opinionated. The Herd with Colin Coward. Weekdays on FS1. Back at the Southern Nationals, powered by Melo with the NHRA on FS1. You know, for nearly two decades, two time Funny Car champion Cruz Pedregon was one of the most feared drivers. But over the last four years, many began to wonder if he would ever return to victory lane again. Well, seven days ago, he answered that question. Kurt Pedregon, though, knows the distance. He's also collected his 35th national event win. Matching win total of another legend, Don the Snake Prudhomme. But years of struggle would ensue, including a 92-race winless streak. We just 
just haven't come that spot, but I feel confident that uh, you know only what I know to do is keep on trucking and keep digging and until we get right. But with a new crew chief and team in place for 2018, crews who he'd soon return to the Sunoco inner circle. We brought Glenn on, Glenn Huzar, who's a very experienced guy. I feel good about this year. And at the Charlotte Four Wide, facing the gauntlet of opponents including 16-time champion John Force, Pedrion would pilot his funny car to victory. How about Cruz Pedragon? He's back. And talking with Cruz Pedragon, he says it wasn't just Aaron Brooks, it wasn't just a new chassis, it was a combination of figuring out the clutch, figuring out the motor, figuring out everything. Cruz Pedragon gets set to take on John Smith, the first of eight pair round one for a fuel funny car division that features 14 female competitors in the history, four winners. The only one in competition today happens to be the number one qualifier. Courtney Force gets set to take on Jeff Deal. Well, there is some bad blood here in this rivalry. Robert Height against Bob Tasca. They are Todd taking on Jack Beckman, Tommy Johnson, Jim Campbell, and another matchup for Johnny Lippert having lane choice against Matt Hagan. It is still a battle for the top 10 between drivers 8 through 14th in the points. We'll highlight that more as we turn attention to John Kirk. Hey, Dave, you said something about Cruz and chassis. That's a DSR chassis, right? Everybody knows that. But what you probably don't know, that chassis was originally being built for Tommy Johnson Jr. And who did Bruce beat in all three rounds of the Pro Whites last week in Charlotte? Oh, Tommy Johnson. That's exactly <laughs> right. Well, now John Smith represents his first round opponent, the son of the legendary Paul Smith, who was runner-up in the first ever match championship. And a big win for Cruz Pedregon in 36. That broke a tie with him in the snake. Well, it took 537 national events for the Cruiser to get 36. It only took Dom Perdome 164 to get his third five. He was tough. Cruz Pedregon, four flat. Did you see the starting line, though? John Smith taking a page out of his old man's book. Deep staging, turning off the pre-stage bulb, something Cruz Pedregon even admitted to doing in the finals of the four wide, but it didn't flinch the cruiser. Well, it's an old trick that you might as well try it. When you have a car, an opponent that is that strong as this Appon car is right now, the other interesting thing is they were the higher qualified car and they opted to be the very first pair. That just tells you what kind of confidence this Snap-on team has in getting down a racetrack. Check out the launch, the Toyota Camry, left front up in the air. All the torque is being applied to that right rear tire, left rear tire on our side of the screen. But just like they didn't qualify, all eight cylinders burning right now, 8,500 pounds of torque being applied. But take a look at this hop light here on the right side of your screen for John Smith. He rolled the car in a little to stay. The problem is he's racing a very experienced season driver that just did the same thing a week ago to try to throw the other drivers off in his final round and uh, didn't quite work against Cruz, but good effort for John Smith. Well, in two weeks, the NHRA packs it up and we will be in Topeka, Kansas, the nation's heartland, if you will. As we set for the Menards NHRA Heartland National presented by Minty with 10.30 Eastern qualifying Friday evening. NHRA today beginning your Sunday, one o'clock in the East with finals right on the tail end of that. Two o'clock Eastern, all the action on FS1. Tony Pettergon, take us back and see what we just now saw. Well, take a look at the right side of your screen. At the end of this run, John Smith wasn't exactly in the race. He was watching Cruz pull away, and his car had a slow drift to the outside, right near the finish line. Pretty good contact. Swipe the side of the body, ground header in. If that video wasn't proof enough, take a look at the header once it got around the corner at the top end. I have a hard time getting that body off later. To make matters worse, he didn't win the race either. Listen to his crew on the radio. That's brother Mike Smith. Didn't get the word to him quick enough. And he obviously knew right away that, that car tagged the wall. Top of your screen, that's Bob Tasca, who has still not won a round of racing this season, although has run well enough to do so. You want to talk about a tough first round opponent? How about the reigning fun car champion, Robert Hunt? He's already scored a couple of runner-ups this year. Tall order, though, for Tass against the Auto Club team. The Auto Club team has done a lot of testing and qualifying. What they're trying to do is get this car to run quicker through 60 to handle some of the new track trap and some of the obstacles. They feel they're the bumps on the other side of the racetrack. So if they can go quicker in six foot, 
and comes down the other side, they're just going to be able to run the kind of numbers they think they need to to win. And so far, that tune's worked. They're running some 860s down in 60 foot. That is that first 60 foot marker that everybody goes by. Press the start for Robert Hyde. Can he do it? I'm just though. That's the big question. Taska now owned his first round win of 2018, and it didn't come in a pretty fashion, but his dad doesn't mind. You know, the question for Robert Hyde was, was how could, how would Jimmy Prock and Chris Cunningham be able to reel that car in? And they weren't able to reel in enough. Meanwhile, Eric Lane, the crew chief for Bob Tesca, well, he's still going to have some cipher and do once he gets back and takes a look at the data. Let's take a look at the replay. Now, you notice Bob Tesca, a little while ago, we talked about a driver deep stitching, rolling the car in, knocking that top light out. It worked. It worked against Robert Hyde. It was extremely late, so this race was essentially won in two ways. Right on the starting line, a big starting line advantage, but then when both cars lost track, Bob Tasca, because he has such a big lead, did a nice job getting out of the throttle. You can see those butterflies close. Now they're open back up, allowing that car to get under power, get to that finish line ahead of the AAA machine. Coming up to the starting line now, you take a look at Bob Tasca, who will pop out a heavy man. He's one of our four female funny car winners. And a happy Bob. Who would that be? Well, if you guessed Courtney Force, you'd be right. Look at the team at the top end. Here comes Courtney Neiman, not Of course, who was the first female funny car winner? Right here. Sister Ashley, right here. She is on property on her 10-year anniversary of the historic Atlanta defeat. Of course, the 2012 Rookie of the Year is going to be a threat to win a championship. She's got a great car, always has in qualifying. And now under the guidance of Brian Karate and Danny Hood, Ashley Hood, or Ashley Forsett's husband, this is a team that's always a threat to win. Their opponent, Jeff Deal. Courtney had a long winless streak she brought earlier this year. You talked about the ability for that team to qualify well. They pretty much won qualifying the last season. But that's not how you win championships. It happens on Sunday. And that's throughout the course of the season. Consistency. And Brian Courtney's come over to this team. From Antron's team. Left hole over there for Antron Brown Racing. We've seen that this season. And really made this team step up in terms of consistency. Give them a better car in race day. you got to love statistician Lewis Williams who digs deep sometimes. You cannot make this up. The last five times Jeff Deal has started here. And losses to Courtney Force, Ashley Force, and John Force. The last two times, Courtney to the opposite lane. Now, that's her husband, Rick Rahal, Indy Cars are his wife. Can pull the win. Trouble. Bigger trouble for Jeff. Coasting across at 458. Graham's life just dodged one there. But I don't know how much more sideways you can get a car as Jeff Deal. If you're at the top end of the racetrack, you could read the sponsors on the side of that machine. Well, let's take a look at replay. Right side of the screen, Jeff Deal. It appeared that his car lost traction just before Courtney, but cooler heads always prevail. For Courtney Force, she kept the car straight. You can feel the car start to lose traction. It'll feed the driver a vibration or some type of a rattle. Then the driver can hear the engine rev up. It's all a matter of how you respond to it. So, Court Force, let's take a look at leave. As the car's accelerating, they're probably getting too much clutch application. That means that that clutch is starting to clamp and trans transfer that, that power to the rear tires. It was just too much. She gets out of the throttle, but take a look right there. She's going to ease back into the throttle as these butterflies, what we call them, allow the air to go back into the engine. It was enough to get her to that finish line. Let's go to the top end in a minute. Yeah, Tony Pedragon was talking about Bob Tasca deep stage. He said he needed to throw everything he had at the reigning Funny Car World Jeff, your first round win of the season, Bob. Yeah, it's hard to believe it took us to Atlanta, but yeah, Pedragon and I were doing a little strategizing last night at dinner. And yeah, I had to throw everything I had at it. Robert and his team is a great team. But this Motorcraft Ford PG car, we've been digging hard. And we got first round win. Hopefully, many more to come. Tony, this was your idea? I might have suggested it once or twice. Yeah, I didn't know he'd funny, actually do it. Two-time funny car champ, 23-time <laughs> national event winner. Are you kidding me? That's where I go for all of my funny car strategizing. <laughs> if I ever get, you know, enough courage. I got to give somebody the pointers. <laughs> Tony, next time I'm racing, you need to give me a few pointers at dinner the night before. We're going to talk for enough. 
Up next, left side, oh boy, Alberto car. Driver, Jim Campbell, races for a legend, big done. On the other side, it is the Make-A-Wish car, Tommy Johnson Jr. At a racetrack, well, it's his kryptonite. Let's get more from John Kern. Yeah, absolutely right. He says he's never run well here. In fact, he's on a streak right now of every other race. He either goes to the finals or he loses in first round. Well, guess what? He went to the finals last week. He's hoping to break that trend right now. One other note, I told you that chassis that Chris's driving was originally being made for TJ. Ask TJ how he felt about it. He says, well, I've got a new chassis, the second one right after Cruz. A little bit different in the old page. They tested it in Vegas. It's pretty good, but they're still running their old car right now. Whoa, got close to that center line. A car that was doing some hunt, but he's able to keep in his lane and get around win at 416. I talked about a place that is kryptonite. Blew the rear end out of a top fuel car in 94. Several big funny car explosions, but Tommy Johnson Jr. advances into round number two. When we come back, a Titanic matchup that involves a 16-time champion and a guy with a lot of Napa know-how. Gaudy numbers as fun car rolls on. The Atlanta Dragway, the Southern National. Hi there, welcome in to NASCAR Race Hub. You see the biggest stars in the sport. Well, I think this we make this look pretty good. They all play here. Fun, fast, fresh, and always entertaining. NASCAR Race Hub, weeknight, 6 p.m. Eastern on FS1. Chamber of Commerce Day here at the NHRA Southern Nationals, powered by Mellow Yellow, the 38th version that features funny car racers John Force, Ron Kepps at the ready line. We're talking about gaudy numbers. A combined 205 national event wins, 70 championships, nine of those wins coming right here at Atlanta Driveway. But statistician Lewis Bloom has more. With this, their 92nd meeting, only John Force and Cruz Pedron have raced more in the history of National Hot Rod Association. Jeez, and guess who waits the winner of this pair? Cruz Pedron. So the big fan base on hand on a beautiful day. This is kind of what you pay the ticket price for. Come see the great stars. Well, there really isn't a better matchup than these two, but you look at how these teams perform in qualifying, and John Force has a clear end, which is not like, not often that we see that, Bruno, but for some strange reason, this Napa car has been plagued with problems, and under these circumstances where it does appear that we've got a little bit of a tricky track, it appears to be a little bit loose past the halfway point. That usually is where Ron told the tutor for Ron Kemp to see where he's at his best. Usually is. I mean, he's the guy you want to your car in hot conditions. But as I mailed the master this week, and John Force has been creeping up and creeping up on it and slowly getting to a point where now he's got a good car again going 397. Well, let's take a look at how these two pros are going to stage. See, John typically doesn't like to go in last. Right, Luan, both in three state. Now comes the dark. Blue. Who first to stage? It is Caps. Now John. Green lights for both the better belonging to Caps. But he's got tire smoke, as does John. And Ron drives around. That's Dodge Schmacher. Yeah, he likes his fun car wins as well. And maybe they haven't been enjoying quite the season they've been used to, too. So round wins, tough to come by. Don Schumacher and his team. Dodge a bullet there because of Ron Caps. Take a look at the right side of your screen. Loses traction first, you're always at a disadvantage. But Ron Caps, this guy must have eaten his Wheaties because he did not allow the distraction by John Force being out in front of him to disrupt what he was doing. Very smooth on throttle, got off the throttle, rolled back, and it went around John Force right at the finish line. Kind of love that peak replay courtesy of our Summit Aerial Camp. Really kind of shows you the ebb and flow between two cars. Well, the ebb and flow continues now. Once the NHRA safety safari gets John Force off the racetrack, it will be Johnny Limmer, driver for Jim Head, back in his Lantico car. Some of Daryl Dam shows you the burnouts of not only John Lindbergh, but his opponent, Matt Hagen, another one of the Don Schumacher cars. Johnny, a two-time alcohol funny car champion in the yellow and white machine. Of course, Matt Hagen, the champion in the Nitro side, 2011-2014. Matt Hagen is a guy who typically goes up there. 
and goes on the home run. And that's Dick Gimbel's making the tuning. If you look at he's a big physical imposing guy. And this team likes to beat their desk to put up big numbers. The problem is, is some of the conditions we've run into the last few weeks hasn't allowed them to do that with any sort of success. So they had actually taken a page back out of like a Ron Tobook where they've maybe changed their, their mindset. So typically over the offseason, you find a way to make more course we can run bigger numbers. Now we're going back to logs from two, three years ago, trying to run high 90s versus trying to run in the low 80s. So it's a different mindset. It's taken a while to get a handle of that. And it's something that's a work in progress at this point. And that's what your brother he refers to. He talks about, hey, just tune your clutch. Get your heart to figure out how to do it. And that's the chess map that the tuners are presented with. And that's what their job is. A little bit challenging, but the driver has to stage allow for a fair start. But be ready for anything, just like Captain Force did in front of him. Hagen able to get the win. 4.106. He won Pomona to start the season. Since then, a seat himself fall. He points down to fourth in standings. Jim Head, he was the runner up here. Ed McCullough back in 1986 and will not advance today with his driver, Johnny Lindbergh in 2018. So let's go back and take a look at the last four runs where there is a trend getting developed, at least the funny car category. It usually starts about 330 feet. Well, you hear some of the drivers allude to a bump. Now, no traffic, no racetrack rather, is dead flat. It's not perfect. So what the tuners are presented with is the challenge of having to accelerate the car just before it gets off of that bump. They have to slow it down. Matt Hagen here, on the other hand, didn't have the most impressive elapsed time, but that tells you his tuner recognized what he was seeing on the track, the pattern that he was seeing in front of him, made the proper adjustment, slowed the car down precisely in that spot, and got a full run rewarded from that. Great job by Dickie Vimbles, the man who calls the shots on the Mopar Express Lane machine. <laughs> So Matt makes the turn off. You hear the cars roar to life. It's J.R. Todd and Matt, Matt, Jack Beckman. Jack Beckman with a trio of tuners. They step away. The first repeat winner in 2018, J.R. Todd brings the DHL car through the water box. And now with loud noise, now quiet from Jack Beckman. An opportunity to go to the top end in a man. Brian Cap thought he might have hit the wall on that run. Gets around John Force. You see the champ out in front of you? Yeah. Yeah, I saw him. That's final round stuff, man. It doesn't get any better in racing John Force. First round on a track that's iffy. And uh, all those years in a dirt car. That That's why I tell Don, thanks for letting me go race dirt cars. Because those experiences right there. I saw him. I saw him blow up. I knew I had to get back on it. I saw the wall coming. Uh, the big big from Napa Auto Parts, the 90th birthday for Napa, and they're all standing the line. You talk about pressure. Pins are all other guys. We don't have lane choice. But, uh, I got Ron Tolbert. That's all we need. You know who won the World Outlaw last night? Hello, Napa driver, Brett Street, the big cat. The so, Dave, I always like to hear what drivers during the weekend. So we heard Leah Bridget talk about going to the lake. Will J.R. Todd face up against Jack Quinn here? J.R. Todd's going to Eldora. That's your world. To which get some racing next weekend. Rather than looking at a drag strip, he likes to kind of immerse himself in the forms of racing. Maybe take a page out of those guys' book like Ron Cap does with his, uh, his his racing. J.R. Todd had problem almost immediately and looked at the black track of Jack Beckman. Right hand turn toward the center lane. Can't cross that if you do. Automatic disqualification as well as the center line infraction deduction in points. Well, J.R. Todd, unfortunately, bows out. Keeping in mind, he scored eight consecutive round wins before finally losing last Sunday in round number two. He isn't going to get out of round one in Atlanta. Well, and how ironic. We were just talking about sprint car driving. And take a look at that raw fuel coming out right from the start. Wide open throttle. The aerodynamics weren't right for J.R. Todd. It's spinning the tires. So you got the car torquing the engine, trying to distribute the weight, and it wants to turn the car. So J.R. Todd didn't have a lot of time to respond. He did what he could, but the car just wasn't set right. In the other lane, Jack Beckman had similar problems, but a little farther down the track. And for Jack, that's pretty scary that the car comes loose because he knows he's probably out in the lead. He feels the car lose traction, dart to the center line. Pretty scary, but he did get his foot out just in the nick of time. Here's a unique look from our summit aerial cam. 
Our Todd keeping the car off of the wall. Just, that is a wall, not a guardrail here at Atlanta Dragway. 23rd race at Atlanta Dragway for the LRS driver. That is Tim Wilkson, who was the runner up here last year to Ron Dapps. Lost that event on a whole shot. His opponent will be Global Electronics Technology Machine of Sean Lang. Tip of the cap to Samantha Bryson. C. Bryson, the owner of Global Electronics Technology, will receive the Friends of Long Beach Award, the National, or excuse me, the Never Forgotten Foundation that helps poverty stricken, underprivileged, and impoverished across the world. Look at the summit aerial came down in our final pair, round one of the fuel funny cars. Tricky track conditions again, but it's Wilkerson. Navigates them the best. 4.185 as he gets set to take on the number one qualifier in lane choice. That 418, by the way, is going to be good enough for lane choice against Corden. The rest of the match on our Lucas Oil ladder. We'll show you that. Cruz Pedregon had the best car of run number one, and the only car Bruno Massel pointed out that went better than 300 miles an hour. Cruz Pedregon will take on Ron Caps. Well, a couple of big matchups on this side. Bob Tasca taking on Jack Beckman. Bob will have, rather, Jack Beckman will have lane choice. And T Tommy Johnson against Matt Hagan. Here's some of the action back in the pits of Ron Caps. You talk about a team that is driven. This is action that happened five minutes and 30 seconds after the team crossed the finish line at the end of the track. Already, the top comes up. This team descends upon this car. And what, Tony, 40 minutes? They'll have it built back up, ready to go again? Well, they'll have it up and running. They'll do a few last-minute adjustments, but right now, every of the 8 to 10 crew member personnel will have a specific job duty. The car will go up on jacks. They'll start to disassemble it and cycle even new or fresh parts into that motor. From the fuel funny car, our attention turn next to the stock when we come back to Southern Nationals. Powered by Mellow Yellow. I am a polarizing fire shark. Here's my problem with what has happened. We have deep rooted issues. Just down the road from the Coca Cola World headquarters, in the home of Mellow Yellow. Welcome back to the Mellow Yellow Drag Racing Series from the 38th Annual NHRA Southern Nationals. You can check out Mellow Yellow Powerhouse. So much fun for kids and for well, big kids like, like us, right? Fun down there. It's always fun to go down there. You know, I, I've stepped up against Jack Hoffman over there and some of the other pros in that reaction timer. And it's always fun to see how you measure up against some of the best of the best. Sometimes it's your day, sometimes it's not. Here comes NHRA Pro Stuck, the ladder presented by Luke Soil. How about Greg Anderson, the 97th number one of his career, the first one of those coming right here at Atlanta Dragway 17 years ago. He will race Val Smeal and Jason Line races Derek Kramer. Well, a pretty big matchup for Alex Loffin going up against the defending series champion Bo Buck, Tanner Gray against Ken Delco, and Jack Hoffman Jr. against his teammate Eric Anders. And under Sunshine Skies, Jason Line and Derek Kramer kick off the action. Jason, the higher qualified car at number eight, has selected the left-hand side. It's the right side of your screen in a car that looks very similar to Greg Anderson. Jeff Kramer's his first round opponent. He's had a little bit of struggle at the starting line here, turning on the red light a few times. But an interesting note, guys, it's the first time that Greg and Jason have not won a race the first six events of the season as teammates. I'm preparing this class. Derek this time. Jason struggles at the gate. Lower qualified car wins 661-4. Next pair up, it's Alex Wolf on the higher qualified car. In this matchup against Bo Bunker, the reigning world champ. Alex has come on board to race all 24 events this season. Back behind the wheel of a pro stock car. He dabbles in some other different sanctioning eyes and different size tires, and he's always out here for since one point to another. The same thing can be said for Bo Butner, who often jumps behind the wheel of a pro modified car these days, but the struggle for Bo Butner has really been qualifying. Only man number 10 spot, something last year they qualified really, really well. Always one of those top three cars. I think the game plan moving forward is them during this downtime, the week offs, do some testing to try and get a better handle on the race. Like early on, they just seem to be missing it a little bit and then playing catch up here on race day. Bo driving for KB Racing. Alex Laughlin are presenting Elite Motorsports. Two teams that, well, have a number of cars fielded here this weekend as they do each and every weekend. Trying to gather data and make the team stronger as a whole. Both of them are staged up and, and Brostock, whoever leaves first usually ends up 
taking the wind line at the park. Well, they're pretty even off the starting line. As Alex Laughlin is in his 50th race. Does he have enough? March of victory, 17th and thousandths of a second. It's Rand Lynn's guy, Bo Butt, that wins via the whole shot. Technically slower on the racetrack. That what was a great drag right there, Tony. I mean, a couple thousands of a second of the tree. You figure it's a, usually a wash 3,000. That ended up being the, the margin of tree down there on the other end. I'll tell you, Bo Butner was plenty motivated, and he also did a very nice job negotiating the track at about 150 feet where that bump is. The car just skated right over it. It's a mellow yellow, go on yellow, whole shot win for Bo Butner, who left 300 quicker than Alex Laughlin, and despite running two, excuse me, three thousandths quicker, despite running two thousand slower on the racetrack, still able to get to that finish line first. And that'll bring us next to Jack Coughlin Jr. up against Erica Enders. There have been only four women that have won championships in NHRA professional categories. While Shirley Bull Downey's won three, Angel's won three in Top Fuel and Pro Stock Motorcycle. Great Force has won in Top Fuel. There's only one in Pro Stock that's ever had a success, and it is Eric Enders. Now, these cars may not be as physically demanding, have as much power as a nitro machine, but inside the cockpit of that car, there is more behind the wheel than practically any other category. It is a delicate balancing act. Basically, it's a different skill set than drive a nitro car because you're balancing between clutch pedal, brake pedal, uh, shifter. You've got a line lock. You, these things have to work in unison. And if you're off by 50 to 100 RPM on shifts, you can fall off all the way down the racetrack. And that's the difference between winning and losing. Question of the elite camps. When will Jack Coughlin win? And who will have that opportunity today to continue the, as he goes 6.59? Erica bows out early. Jack Coughlin now will carry the mantle. Unless Vincent Nobile, who's in the next pair, advances. He's also got elite power under the hood. As he gets set to take on Alan Brzezinski. Couple of finals, the big four wide win at Las Vegas. As we debuted it. Out of West Coast this year it was fun. It really was, and it's fun talking with the folks uh, from Mountain View Tire. You know, they're uh, a rowdy bunch. They like to have fun at the racetrack. And Nick and Irene, yeah, those the plan early this year. They was only run 16 races. As soon as they won there in uh, that four wide race, that changed. The plan changed very quickly to now 24. So they're all in for the season. It's great to have them on board for the whole run this season. Taste of Pen will do that, won't it, Tony? It has a tendency to pick up the spirits <laughs> and open the wallet. See how the Rockway Jersey runner handles Vincent Nobile. He did a great job at the starting line, but unfortunately, tire shake and a car that's out of groove will cost Allen as Vincent advances with a solid 6.586 second past that ties low elapsed time of the race. Who does he share that with? He happens to share it with Greg Anderson, who comes to the starting line when we come back. Already a four time winner, Greg Anderson looking for his first win of the year next on FS1. Not all opinions are created equal. I wouldn't say I'm wrong. No chance. <laughs> the Herd with Colin Cowan, weekdays on FS1. Back in Atlanta, Georgia, NHR Nitro School this week featuring Alan Reinhardt, track announcer, along with Richie Crandon in front of a good group of folks loving to learn a little bit more about what Nitro racing is all about. You're shortening the racetrack the further you go into the beams. So, you know, the car lapse time might not be uh, as quick. However, you're, you know, just closer to the finish line, which can make or break you, just like it did here two years ago for my teammates, J.R. Todd and Doug Coletta. It was basically a draw at finish line. Yeah, and less than half an inch. If J.R. would have been a half inch further in the beams, he would have won that race. So, uh, there's a lot to staging, and, um, you know, it's, uh, a lot of drivers have a different all that conversation about staging that led that epic final between J.R. Todd and Doug Coletta where the scoreboard had a margin of victory. Four zeros on the right side of the decimal. Peter said Doug Coletta won that one. Pro Stock continues now with Kenny Delco and Young Tanner Gray. Red line start for Delco gives it away. But Tanner Gray says, I'm going to run it through there. It goes 662 to advance. Tanner Gray gets set now. Pick on Jack Coughlin, round number two. Chegg will pick his lane. Kenny Delco coming into this matchup knew that he had to roll the dice, try something on starting line. 
you're a little too quick, you get that red light, you're automatically disqualified. Bo Butner was up here laughing with Alex Laughlin. So he always beats me, but the by one thousandth of a second margin of victory, you got it this time. Yeah, that was just a little extra shot of Melio there. So uh, we just improved. Uh, we get better and uh, got behind the eight ball starting out, but let's just keep going around. So get most improved every round. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Drew Skillman holds an NHRA record. You know, to win one race in one day, that's one thing. To do two different categories in the same day, that's called double, something 25 drivers have done a total of 39 times. But he is the only driver when their first and second wallies on the same day doubling here in Atlanta back in 2012. Drew Schillman set to take on Wall Stroop, the orange car. That's really incredible. That's a great way to jump start your career. You know, to put two of them on the shelf. What, what a way to kick things off. And Drew's been successful not only behind the wheel, different sportsman cars that he and his family drives. And it's great because it's a family team. He's got his grandfather still comes out and races in the Cop Eliminator category. His dad's got a factory stock car. And uh, these guys are great for the sport. And Drew has done a great job wheeling that stock car as well to a few victories to his credit. Wally Stroop comes out of North Carolina. The car he built himself his first race as a kid. Cheney Side Dragway, North Carolina. And now he's driving up here in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, let's just say there is a lot of skill in that Skillman team as Drew takes win 6.587 seconds. Drew Skillman advances to take on the man we just heard from a moment ago, Bo Butner, round two. It is a vacant left lane. Do you look inside the cockpit of Greg Anderson? He's scheduled to race the Shirley New York run by Smealand, but some engine troubles, a hole in a block, means that they will not occupy the left lane. So a free shot for Greg Anderson here, who's been to 11 finals and 20 prior events. An opportunity for you to crank it up now as Greg Anderson goes through the gearbox in this edition of Crank It Up. Ooh. And a car that got dangerously close to the center line. Imagine being disqualified on a single. Doesn't happen often, but it can. Yeah, that could have been ugly for Greg if Al Smeelan was able to pull in the other lane. Greg has struggled on race day. He's qualified number one a number of times this year, but not been able to get down the racetrack well, to that kind, of per, uh, that kind of performance on Sunday. And he's got to be kicking himself a little bit right there because that's an opportunity to get some data he wasn't able to achieve. And just to clarify, NHRA rules, you cannot lose on a single once you have taken the green light. So Greg Anson was going to advance regardless. He would have lost points, though, due to the center line fraction should he have crossed. This is Chris McGay with at least one win in each of the last four years, our last pair. So he gets set to take on the auto deck from Baltimore, Maryland, John Gaydosh Jr. 124th race in Chris McGay's career. He's got a U.S. national under his belt. He's got a team. That's another fun-loving group. They want to hang out in the pit late after the races. I had a restaurant. In the days of the Cop Eliminator categories, he's pit next to me many a time, and uh, we had a cold beverage or two, to say the least. A great family operation again, and a guy who's uh, doing this on his own is an independent driver. He's had one of the best running race cars all week long. Out of the gate second, both cars wiggling there. Chris McGahey able to keep it corralled as he goes 6.591 seconds. It's going to be Chris Gehe and Vincent Nabil coming up in the second round. So great job by the Harlow Salmon team. And now we can graphically show you all of the matchups on our Lucas Oil ladder. Heading to round number two, they include Greg Anderson versus Derek Kramer. Kramer with the lane choice. Vincent running just 100 better than McGehe will pick his. Oh, look at Drew Scum with lane choice over Bo Butner and Tanner Craig going up against Nick Coffin Jr. A couple of sharpshooters on that starting line. Time now for our mother's best appearing car. It is the Chevy SN, the 2000 version belonging to Jim Perry. But my Suncoast race cars, that's a good looking ride right there. It is a good looking ride and it is one that performs very well. It's won the internationals four times, two different drivers and a car that Jim Perry drove to a Super Gas World Championship back in 2009. Congratulations to Jim and that mother's best appearing car, or in this case, truck. Well, Denver 1996 on Mountain is when Angel Sampe made her professional debut. Later that year in Maple Grove, came the first of her 42 national event wins. And prior to racing action this weekend, the two-time champ joined Amanda Busick as it's time to walk a 1,000 feet. On Jelsey Pay, the winningest woman driver in all of professional motorsports. 
When you hear that, what impact does that have on you? You know, a long time ago, I didn't really like the title because I wanted to be the winningest. I don't want to be the winningest female. But as I've grown older and I've realized how tough the sport is, winning a single time is really tough. To be the winningest female of all time, I'm so proud of it. And especially now that I have a little girl and I get to tell her that, I get to teach her that no matter what it is she wants to do, she can do it. You describe yourself as a Cajun girl from the Bayou of Louisiana. What are Cajun traits? <laughs> Uh, you know, I think the biggest and most important one is everybody in Louisiana is raised to know that there's no one better than us and we are better than no one. You kicked off your career in 1996. Four races later, I think you took a pole position. Did you think that success happened so quick? Actually, that that race, four races into my career, not only did we get number one qualifier, also set the national ET record and won the race against Dave Boats, who was the greatest of all time. I was in awe just like everybody else. You retired in 2010. Did you think you would come back? No, I, I knew I wouldn't come back. It was just that I had put my personal life up for so long. I wanted to be a mom. The only thing I was missing was the adrenaline rush, and I was trying to find a way to fulfill it. You returned in 2015 with one goal in mind. What was that? Is to show my daughter what she can accomplish. Hard work makes dreams come true, and so that's what I'm here to prove to her. And Angel, as we approach the finish line, what would your victory dance be? I'll show you what we've been practicing. I didn't come here to dance. Ooh. And at your wall, 1,320 feet, with someone I'm never messing with, Angel Sampe. And I can promise you, everybody in Pro Stock Motorcycle knows that she doesn't come here to dance. She's here to win since Hector Rana Jr. by five hundredths of a second, his first pole this year. Jerry Savoy will sit on Steve Johnson. And Hector Rana going up against another one of the very successful women in racing, Aaron Stouffer, Corey Reed against Scotty Polichuk, and Matt Smith against Angel Tampe. And we kick off our round one highlights with the drivers in positions eight and nine. It's Steve Johnson, who started the year aboard a team bike to Jerry Savoie, but now he's back on his own ride as Ellie Tomlin back in the White Alligator Racing Team. Nobody in any big hurry to get off the start line here, but it's going to be Jerry Savoie that stretches out the advantage, crosses the stripe first at 6.936 seconds. Next up would be Hector Rana, the Luke Doyle scooter that had a few problems getting it started. Going up against Karen Stouffer, one of the winning women in Pro Talk Motorcycle, eight-time national event winner. Garrett tried, but wasn't able to do it. Hector Arana takes the win. Father's son, by the way, it went two. And qualifying son went number one. Epping 2014. That is Angie Smith's greatest day in drag racing. Her one and only Wally. Pro Stock Motorcycle category. She's up against former champion, Ellie Tonglin. I mentioned back with the White Alligator Racing Team. And riding with the stripe, just like the team owner did. 6.904 seconds. Ryan Ayler celebrated a birthday just a few days ago. He will take on the 200 mile an hour runner, number one qualifying Hector Rana Jr. Ryan Ayler knows he needs pick up in the performance department, gets a slight advantage off the starting line. Junior drops another bump, 6.819 seconds. That's the second best time slip. Pro Stock Motorcycle this weekend, they are getting settled in on great tune up. Melissa Serber only has one round win, looks for her second ever round win up against Eddie Craig. But when you're second off the struck by a bunch and taking on Eddie, that's going to be tough. Already a four time winner here in the last nine years. Eddie Craywick is into round number two as he advances to take on Ellie Tonglin. Next up at the Yellow Corn team, Joe Gladstone on the left side of the green up against his teammate Andrew Hines. Joey did a good job in the tree, got an advantage by about four and a half hundredths of a second, but just not enough motorcycle to hold off that Harley Davidson. 6.917 sec seconds, the winning time slip for Andrew Heiss. Here's Matt Smith, laid Choi firmly in his back pocket against on just Sampay, the winningest woman in HRA history, but he throws it away with an 030 red light. And to make matters worse, he's pulling away, just got too much horsepower, but. 
Ashtown population. Matt Smith on jealous team there. Corey Reed that was having transmission issues yesterday, but got it figured out and was on the right side of that red light to take the win. And finally, Scotty Polacek up against Corey Reed. A motor change in the fourth session. Scotty missed the final qualifying effort. Curry filing, filing a little bit of a sponsorship this week going to Fire Aid and Larry Morgan doing his motors. Found some power this weekend, but not enough to get around Scotty Palachuk in round one. So the Lucas Oil ladder heading to round number two for the Pro Stock Motorcycle. Sees Hector Rana Jr. at 681 take his lane against Jerry Savoy, Ellie Tonglin, Eddie Krawick, an interesting matchup there. Well, another Hirana, the senior version, owing up against Scotty Polachek, and Andrew Hines will pick his lane against Angel Sampe. And although she didn't win today, Amanda Busick's at the top, and with a woman that debuted the same day as Angel Sampe. Who is that, Karen Stouffer? We're celebrating the women of power in NHRA here this week, and Karen Stouffer, one of those women competing on site here today. Karen, as a woman of power in the NHRA, what does that mean to you? You know, I think it's really awesome. Uh, you know, this I've always said that NHRA is one of those sports that really never had any problem with diversity. It just kind of naturally occurred. We've got women, we've got age, we've got everything you can think of, and it just happened naturally. There was nothing forced about it. So I think that's pretty cool. It's awesome for NHRA. I'm really excited about about being the female. I'm, being, I'm one of the hopefully one of the top ones still, and uh, very proud to be part of NHRA. And it's a family sport as well, where female sisters have enjoyed a lot of success. Courtney Force looks for a 10th national event win. You got Brittany in the middle, the top few champion. And how about Ashley, who here, right here in Atlanta Dragway, 10 years ago, became the first ever female winner in Funny Card. Nitro, round number two, is right around the corner. NASCAR Race Up. Fun. Fast.